everything tonight. Uh, what an honor to be here in New York to be a part of this conference. Uh, I thank so much those that invited me to be a part of this, the pastors and the leadership. Uh, thank you for this privilege and this honor to get to come and minister with you this, this wonderful time. We have been loving New York. It's so funny to me how many people are saying, isn't it hot here? Isn't it? And I have to remind them, we're from Texas. The only time I felt like I was really at home was when we went into the city today and we were in the subways. And there was, you know, just the heat down there. One of the guys was like, I'm so sorry. I know this is so hot. And I was like, I feel like now I'm home. <laughs> that was the only place I felt like, now this is Houston. This is home. So it is such a joy to be here, to get to worship with y'all. To, to, to be a, the, the body of Christ getting to come together. And just what a wonderful time to worship together and hear the word of God together and concerts together. And just, I've been so excited about being a part of this, this evening and this conference with you. I've been excited about seeing God move. I've been excited about meeting new brothers and sisters in Christ. I've been excited about having chicken and rice. It's been a wonderful, wonderful time already. And again, I thank you. Body of Christ, thank you for allowing me to be a part of this with you. And once again, leadership. I honor you and thank you for the opportunity to minister to the people. I'd like to ask you right now, if you would, if you would take your Bibles and if you would stand with me. As you take your Bibles, I want you to hold them up high tonight as we make a proclamation. Repeat after me, this is my Bible. Yeah, I know we can do better than that. This is my Bible. Just 
describes something different. In Mary's hand, she is holding this small jar of very expensive perfume called nard. Isn't that a great name? Nard. I mean, right today we've got, you know, eternity. Eternity. They've got nard. Well, she comes walking in this room. Well, let me give you an idea. I don't know the teenagers are going, oh, okay, big deal. But teenagers, I want you to understand this. I want you to pretend for a moment. What's the price tag of nard? Let me, let me give you an example. If your parents can to you and said, sweetheart, this year we're not going to pay taxes. We're in, of course, you have no hair in New York. It's a huge thing. We're not going to pay taxes. We're not going to pay for the house. We're not going to pay for the car. We're not going to buy food this year. We're not even going to buy clothing. Instead, we're going to give you all the money that we make this year. We're going to give it to you. To buy one bottle of perfume. That's how much money costs. Mary walks in the room and she walks up to Jesus and she breaks the top of the bottle off. And when she breaks the top of the bottle off, the room fills with this incredible aroma. A couple years ago, my wife, I decided to buy my wife some of her favorite perfume. It wasn't our anniversary, it wasn't her birthday, I wasn't even in trouble. <laughs> I just decided to buy my wife her name some of her favorite perfume. And so I'll be honest with you, I really wish I had some of you girls there with me because I'm not even a good shopper and I don't know girl terms. I go up to the camera and I tell them, I need this kind of perfume. See, I don't know the difference. Vocabulary. I don't know the difference between, you know, cologne, perfume, body splash. You know, I don't know those terms. So I walk up to the counter and I say, I need this kind of perfume. The lady looks at me, she says, how much do you want to spend? I reach into my pocket and I pull out all my crinkly dollar bills, I put it up on the counter. I said, 80 bucks. Spend the whole thing. <laughs> She hands me this. <laughs> right? We know it's really good. If I just spent eighty dollars, I should get a jug of something. <laughs> right? Here's a jug. Yeah, just spray her down with this. You know? They hand me this. Well, I give it to my wife, she loves it. Keeps it in her purse. I don't know what happened. I don't know if that purse fell over or somebody stepped on that purse. I don't know what happened, but all I do know is somehow that little bitty eighty dollars of perfume got broke in my wife's purse. And she didn't even have to tell me. She just came walking in one night. I'm going, <laughs> got it on a bit fake, don't you, babe? <laughs> well, when Mary broke the top of that perfume off, that room. Now, at this point, don't you know, the disciples are starting to turn and look at Mary. You see, there's something you need to understand about Mary. When Mary got around Jesus, she got weird. And Mary walks over to Jesus where Jesus is seated, and she kneels down at his feet. And she takes that bottle of perfume, and she begins to pour the perfume out on his feet. She then takes the garment covering her hair and she pulls it off. And her hair falls down on her shoulder. And she turns her face toward the feet of Jesus and she begins to wipe his feet with her hair. Now I'm sure at this point the disciples, probably like even some of you right now, are going, Why? Several years ago, when, when I was in seminary, my, one of my sons was, was about four years old. And I got to be honest with you, I was in seminary, and I was a paper that was supposed to be turned in, the paper was late. I am hurrying, I'm trying to get this paper done, I'm rushing as fast as I can, I have a deadline, and all of a sudden, my little son comes toddling in there in his little pajamas, comes and just stands right beside me. Now, I, I got to be honest with you, okay? Can I just be honest here? The paper was late. I had to get this paper done. I was hoping that if I ignored my son, he would go away. Now, I know you're like, you're a bunch of bad dad. No, I'm serious. I had to get this paper done. And so I'm thinking, if I ignore him, he'll go away. And he just stood there. I'm typing. I'm like, I didn't think things over. He's just standing there. And finally, I'm like, what? His name is Ben. I said, Ben, what? What did you want? And he looks up at me with those little 
big eyes and he doesn't accept nothing. I just, I just want to be near you. Inside, there's a worship going on. Open your mouth, let the 
Lazarus. Mary and Martha, they write a letter to Jesus and they said, Jesus, the one that you love, isn't that a great title? Oh, I don't want other people to write Jesus and say, God, the, the, the one that you love. Huh? Oh, that's Scott. Oh, I love that title. The one that you love is sick. And they asked him, Jesus, will you come? We know the story. Jesus did not come. How many of us in this room know that God's timing is not always our timing? Can, can I tell you something? God's got to watch. God answers prayers for our friends. He does it in His time. Some of the times, we can get very impatient waiting on God. Can I tell you something? Wait on God again. They that wait upon the Lord, He'll renew your strength. You will mount up the wings as eagles. You'll run and not be weary. You'll walk and not faint. Wait on God and His best. Young single girls that are here tonight saying, Jesus, I'm just praying for a man of God. <laughs> just want a good looking man of God. Kind of need you to hurry over again. Wait on God. Because sometimes God's time is not ours. That's why the scripture tells us in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge God, and He will direct your steps. The scripture says that Jesus finally went back to where Lazarus was. But we know the story. Lazarus was already dead. Have you been there? Have you been there when you prayed and the heavens were silent? Did you cry out to God? Did you cry out to God in tears? Blood your face and stay in the ground, and you called unto God, and it was silent, and God did not answer. Have you been there? Mary and Martha, they loved Jesus. Jesus loved them. Jesus loved Lazarus. But yet, when they wrote and said, Come, our brother said, Jesus stayed where he was. Watch, watch! Jesus loved Mary and Martha, loved Lazarus. Can I ask you a question? Did Mary and Martha know that Jesus could heal their brother? That's, that's where you respond. Yes. But did they know he could raise him from the dead? I don't know who this is for, but I want you to go over this. There are some of you here tonight that you pray prayers and seemingly you thought they were not answered. That's because God is going to show you something bigger than we'll pray for you. Can I tell you also this? God is all about developing us. He wants us to be made into the likeness of Christ. And please hear me. God is more concerned about our character than our comfort. God wants to develop men of God in his room. He wants to develop mighty pastors. He wants to develop women of integrity. He wants to develop us. So the scripture says that Jesus goes back to the city. And when he comes into the city, Mary and Martha, they come up and they're in tears. And they looked at him. And, and, and they spoke the words that many of us have wanted to speak to Jesus. But we thought it was so unspiritual that we didn't do it. Or if you just would have done something about this. Have, have you been there before? Or you wanted to be angry at God? I won't go and take off my little mask right now and say, I have. I've been angry at God. I didn't understand his game plan. I didn't understand his logic. But you know what? He didn't call me God. I call him God. Hallelujah. And there are times when I have got to be willing to trust him even when I don't understand. That is called faith. Mary and Martha come up and they said, Jesus, if you just would have been here, our brother would have died. Can I tell you something beautiful about our Jesus real quick? He knows our pain. That's one of the beautiful things about Jesus being here on earth. When Jesus came here on earth, he went through pain. He went through suffering. For people that are in this room, that you look up at God and say, God, do you know how painful it is going through this? Jesus is there as our mediator going, yeah, I was there. When you pray to Jesus and you say, Jesus, I have these friends and I thought they were harming me, and they turn their back on me. Jesus, do you know what that's like? I still can feel the kiss. And we have a mediator who sympathetic to our needs.
known for real. That really is a difficult situation. You need to send ministering angels down there to minister. I mean, you know, right? Because when Jesus saw Mary and Martha in their tears, the scripture says Jesus wept. Can we work? We can worship tonight just for the mere fact. Like people have been talking about, I'm not going, when Jesus went to the cross, took our sins, died, rose from the grave, and sent his next to the Father, we can worship him. All I'm going just for that. But that's not all. It goes on. It's not a period there, it's a column. And the next sentence is, we have a sympathetic Savior. We don't have a God that's sitting up in heaven. There's not all of who doesn't have any kind of idea of what man has gone through. Jesus knows what we're going through. He wept. Every one of your tears. Do you hear this? Hear this tonight. When you think that God doesn't have a clue what's going on in your life, the pain that you're going through, the scripture says Jesus keeps every one of your tears in a joy. He knows your frustration, young girl. He knows the fear that you've got for those of you that are sitting here going, I don't know what college I'm going to go to. I don't know how it's going to be paid for. Listen to me. God is sympathetic. He knows what's going on. And I want you to hear this too. God's not broke. We just got to hear that real quick. It's amazing to me. I work with a lot of college students. A lot of college students who just, oh, Jesus, I'm believing. Yes, Lord. God, you're good. And I mean, I trust you. You're the Prince of Peace. And then when it comes time to pay tuition for college, they start just freaking out their parents. As though God is up in heaven going. It costs how much? No, no, we, we've got it. They just, I. I just know, I just didn't know you're going to be in school that long. <laughs> our God is not broke. And our God is a sympathetic Savior. And Mary and Martha come up to him, they to leave, but Jesus wept with them, and then, oh, the story gets really fun. Jesus looks at them and he says, Take me where you bury Lazarus. You see, Lazarus had already been dead and buried for four days. And they said, come with us, Jesus. Everybody's thinking, Jesus is just going to the tomb to weep. So they go to the tomb. Now, now, let's paint this out real quick. Because of the fact that Mary and Martha and Lazarus were wealthy, they were probably buried in a wealthy tomb. If you remember where Jesus was buried, he was born buried in a wealthy man's tomb. And the way that they worked that many times is they would find a cave or they would dig out a hole on the side of a mountain. Now watch this because this is very important. And what they would do is they would go in there and they would chisel out literally like tables or beds in which to lay the different bodies. You would have a family too, which worked out pretty cool because if somebody dies, you roll away the stone with the body in there. Next person dies, you roll the stone away and you put the next body in there. I mean, there's your family tree right there, you know. There's grandma, grandma, and you let them love me. Here's the whole plan. Well, the scripture says that Jesus goes over the tomb and this whole big crowd of people. There's a huge crowd of people. They're all following because they've heard about Jesus. And they go up to the tomb. How many of you in your life have had times where God has asked you to do something that you thought was just bizarre or weird? I don't understand why you're asking me this, God. Oh, brother, if you're sharing his testimony, you are sick, you're right, you're cancer, your whole body has been split wide open, tell them about my goodness. What does Jesus do? He walks up to the tomb, and he goes, roll away the stone. Excuse me? Roll over the stone. Uh huh. <laughs> hey Jesus, can we have a word with you real quick? <laughs> hey, I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, he's dead. Uh, he's been in there four days. Count four. One, two, three. <laughs> he's stinking. <laughs> And if you got a King James Version Bible here, that's exactly what it says. Surely the Lord has stained it. <laughs> Jesus goes, okay, blah, 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 roll away the stone. <laughs> they roll away the stone and then Jesus does something really incredible. Now, I don't know how many of you have seen 
different movies, depictions of Jesus. A lot of times when they, when they do stories about Jesus, they always have to make it look very holy, very spiritual. Jesus walks up to the woman and goes, said the Lord. Oh, look at the compassion in his eyes. <laughs> And I always love the Hollywood thing of, of every time Jesus is about to do some kind of a miracle. Have you ever noticed that? Yeah, all of a sudden he gets this glow behind his head. I don't know what that is. It's like we got little angels on the spotlights. I got a one five block. <laughs> and Jesus, I don't know how he does this, but even as he's about to do a miracle, you know when he's about to do a miracle when you're watching the movie because he gets reverb in his voice. Lazarus, <laughs> Jesus walked up to the tomb, and with the voice of a man, but the authority of God, he looked inside of the tomb and he said, Lazarus, come forth, exclamation point. And you know, the very first time I really started looking at that verse, I was asking questions, God, why did you say Lazarus? Why did you call him by name? Why didn't you just say, come forth? And I realized Jesus has such authority. If he would have said, come forth, every dead person on that tomb would have come walking out of there. <laughs> and wouldn't that have been embarrassing to Jesus? Ooh, ooh, my bad, my bad. <laughs> Kill them all that's up to God in front. <laughs> see the movie about Lazarus, of course, they can't be human, right? They gotta look real spiritual. And normally Lazarus comes out of the tomb. Lord? Lord? People, you gotta keep in mind in the days of Jesus, wealthy people, they mummify these individuals. <laughs> now what I love here is if you will notice what is the very next thing that Jesus says. If you look down at your scripture, look down, the very first thing that Jesus says is what? My body, take off the grave clothes. Why? He is covered from head to foot in gauze in grave clothes. Jesus is sitting there going, look, if you don't take that stuff off his face, he's going to suffocate and die. And then i got to do it all over again. I'm a busy man. Lazarus comes out and he is covered from head to toe in grave clothes. Now, dead people are actually supposed to wear grave clothes. I mean, that's what they do with dead people. You're dead, they put you in great clothes, right? If that's so easy for us to understand, why is it that so many of us in this room claim to be alive in Christ, but yet we still wear our great clothes? Stay with me, stay with me. This is what I mean. Before you came to Jesus, before you asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart, the Bible says that you and I were, here's the word, dead. Say dead. We were dead in our trespasses and sin. But, when we came to Christ, when we asked Jesus to come inside our life, the Bible says you who were once dead have now been made alive. When you are dead, it's okay to wear great clothes. But when you're alive, they stay. Show them. The scripture tells us this. The scripture tells us this in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. If you're taking notes, you just jot that down. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. The Bible says that we are to, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Throw it off. Now, I know we've got athletes in this room. I saw some of the young men and women coming in this room. I'm going, athletes. There's older people in here that wish they were. <laughs> but I am, I'm just going to tell you, in a flat out sprint, I would take any high school or any college student on. Now, there's some yelling at me going, your mom. <laughs> So let's say for the sake of our illustration here tomorrow morning, before our service, we have our sprint. I got all my athletes showing up, right? I mean, all my serious athletes are showing up, right? They're out there, man, they're stretching out. They got on their little breeze shorts, man, their tank tops, man, they're getting ready. And all of a sudden, I come walking out. 
I come walking out, I'm carrying a television in my arm. Strapped on my back, I got a computer system. I am wearing every stitch of clothing that I own. Inside my pockets, I have CDs, I have computer games. And I come walking up to the beginning line, the starting line, and I look back at everybody and go, Okay, guys, show time. Now I have this one club going, <laughs> Scott, did you mean paint chips as a child? Why? Because every single one of us in this room know that if you are willing to run a race, you take off everything that slows you down. My friends, I want you to hear something. I truly believe that there are many of us in this place tonight that God is in His sanction. God has said there are blessings that I have for you. I want to take you to the next levels, but I can't do it while you still have the great clothes on. What does the great clothes mean? Before you came to Jesus, before, before you came to Jesus, you could read whatever magazines you wanted to. You could drink whatever you wanted to. You could date whoever you could get away with. You could do whatever you wanted to. Why? The Bible says you were dead. But when we become alive in Christ, the rules change. I had a young girl in my youth group. Her name was Jamie. Jamie was an average sophomore girl. Wonderful girl who loved Jesus. Had her ups and downs. Jamie came up to me one day and she said, Scott, she said, man, you got to pray with me. Something's wrong. I said, really, what's going on? She said, Scott, I try to read my Bible and it's like it makes no sense. She says, I try to pray and it was like my prayer stopped, man, right at the ceiling. She said, Scott, i got to be honest with you. I'm really losing interest in spiritual things, and I'm getting really tempted to go back to my old friends. Now, this way to you, I didn't have a word from God. I didn't have a prophetic, you know, Scott, listen. I didn't have that. I just was asking her questions as a young youth minister would, and I looked at Jamie, and I said, Jamie, can I ask you something? Is there anything in your life right now that God has shown you that you need to get rid of? I said, really? Like what? She goes, some of my music. I said, get rid of it. She goes, no. I said, fine, then you do with God. This went on for about three weeks. Right? Three weeks. Now, Jamie, who was in high school, she had this agriculture class. Man, in Texas, we like to race farmers. <laughs> yeah. And in this class, it was an ag class, and then they call it ag class, and they never do anything like in this class, at least in hers. She said, we never did anything. And she, Jane, would call me from class about once a week just to talk. She calls me from class, I can tell she's still frustrated. I said, Jane, can I ask you something? Have you done anything about that music God told you to get rid of? She goes, no. What are you doing right now? Well, I can act nothing. I said, let me come get you. Fine. Bing. I go over to the school with this school being the vice principal. I had a wonderful relationship, wonderful believing man. He let me get kids out of school whenever I needed to. Don't get ideas. <laughs> <laughs> it's not because of this, I need to get right with God. There is really good. <laughs> I go over to school, I get Jamie out of school, we go over to her house. Her mom is looking at us like, what are you doing here? And I remember this, we stop at the stairs before we go into her room and we pray, God, you show us everything that we need to get rid of, and you show us everything that will bring you pleasure and that we can keep. Amen. We walked upstairs, man, we opened up her closet, here were all of her CDs. She took out a box, get rid of, get rid of, get rid of, keep, 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 get rid of, get rid of. By the time we finished, she had a shoebox overflowing with tapes and CDs. We went back to our church, we had just torn down a building to build a new building. We went out to our church and we took a couple of pieces of concrete and we made a little table, a little altar if you will. I poured all that music, all those tapes and CDs in this huge pile, and then I took 50 cents with the gasoline. Now I want you to hear this real quick. <laughs> we 
when Jamie told me what she wanted to do with her music, I looked at her and I said, Jamie, why don't you just give the music away to someone? This is what a sophomore in high school said to me, the youth minister. She said, Scott, I don't think that nobody else does. <laughs> You're spiritual. I took that gasoline, I poured it out on top of all that music, and I pulled out my, my, my pocket book of matches. I took out a match, and I was just about to light it, and all of a sudden, Jamie stopped me. She grabbed my hand and waited. Let me. She took those matches, she lit it. Should have seen it. I mean, smoke was coming up. The metal was just like that. Heavy metal. It was. It was just melting and just dripping on that little table. And all you could hear was the CDs popping, and you could hear the, the plastic sizzling. And Jamie standing there. All you could hear then was her laughing. She scared me at that point. <laughs> Do you know what was taking place? Jamie was watching some of her great friends go in smoke. You see, before she came to Jesus, maybe listen to whatever music you wanted to. Why? You don't belong to God. Wait a minute, wait a minute, God, wait a minute. I thought we were all children of God. No, we're not. We're God's creation. When you ask Jesus Christ to be your heart, that's when he adopts us and we become his child. When Jamie asked Jesus into her heart, God said, listen, I want to take you to new levels of joy. I want to take you to new levels of purity. I want your mind where I can speak and you can hear about the great things that I'm going to show you, the great things that I'm going to do through you. I've got wisdom and insight that I want you to hear. And that music, no, it can't happen. Jamie, you want to go to new levels? Yes, God. Can't, Lord. Great flows. I'll tell you another thing about great flows. Great flows are a poor substitution for God's best. Great flows are a poor substitution for God's best. I met a young girl a couple of years ago, a beautiful girl, senior in high school, her name was Atara. I met Atara and I was speaking one night, we were actually talking about great clothes. And Atara comes walking up, she's got a boyfriend with her, this huge guy that played on the football team, and her boyfriend's talking to somebody, and Atara, she was sassy. Girl got in my face. She goes, I need to talk to you. She goes, I got great clothes in my life. I said, really? What is it? She goes, him. <laughs> Can we talk about this later? <laughs> Boyfriend's name was Stephen. Stephen was just there for the night. He took off. And later I sat down with Atar and I said, what's up, Atar? We're trying to break up with the guy. She said, no, I love him. I said, is he... Is he a Christian? Is he a believer? He tells me he is. I said, okay, Tara, you gotta get some longer sentences here. What's going on? She says, Scott, God's made it real clear to me. He's not supposed to be on the line. I said, what are you gonna do? She goes, I don't know. The next night, Tara came up to me and she said, I did it. I said, what did you do? She said, I called Stephen on the phone and I told her we're done. I said, no, listen. I don't know how it works. But somehow when we take off gray clothes and we throw them aside, they develop feet. And they come walking back. And they look up at us with those big, gray, blue eyes. 
true because the next morning, Sunday morning, when we got to church, Stephen showed up and proposed. It's ours in God. Listen to me, I wish I could tell you tonight that if you take off the grave clothes, that if you trust God and you take off the grave clothes, it's going to be easy. I would love to tell you a little fairy tale. Listen, some of you right now, you've got things in your life that shouldn't be there, but you'll get rid of it. It's so easy. Listen, that's not the case. Because the reality is when you take off gray clothes, it hurts. When you take off things that have been in your life for a long time, some of those things that we think are so dear to us, so important to us, and God sees them as dangerous, when He tells us to take them off, and we do, it's not easy. It's a difficult thing to be obedient before the Holy God. Three months had gone by before since I had spoken at a Taurus church. The youth minister had called me up and invited me to come back again to speak. I grabbed the opportunity because I wanted to see a Tara. I knew she was broken. I knew she was still hurt over this. I had scriptures that I wanted to, to, to read to her. I had jokes I wanted to tell her. I knew she was going to be broken. And when I come up to the church, I'm looking for a car and, and through the youth group, here comes a car, just like bouncing up to him with this huge grin. And I said, a car? And she goes, his name is Eric. I went, no! She said, no, 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 listen. She says, Scott, I am telling you. This guy is incredible. We read the Word of God together. We're praying together. This summer, we're going to go on a mission project with the church together. He says, God, here's the reality. If I were to broke over Stephen, I'd have never met this guy. Students, I want you to hear something tonight. Great clothes are a bad substitute for God's best. When God shows us something that He wants us to take off and let go of, be in music, be in relationships. And listen to me, please hear me. This is a hard one. Sometimes even dreams. Would you be willing to take those things and say, God, I'll be obedient to you. I will take them off. Because it's when we take off the things that God says to let go of, that is when we will experience the freedom of obedience. That's when we will experience the life that God says, you know, we read inside the Word of God. And I know some of us will go, where is this joy? Where is this abundant life? Where Where's this excitement about being a believer? Listen, if you are bored being a child of God, if you're bored being a Christian, can I tell you something? You're not doing it right. Because there is abundant life that God has in store for us. But for some of us, the reason you're not experiencing abundant life is because you still want great thoughts. That God has said thank you. I'll give you one last picture. Adults, be patient, let your youth join in. Youth, right now, I want you to pretend that you have on a necklace. A necklace made of rabbit dung. Rabbit dung necklace. And your father walks in the room right now and he says, I've got a brand, I've got something for you. And he opens up a box and inside is this beautiful, pure diamond necklace. Of course, of course, the girls in this room are going, Yes, Lord. <laughs> And Jesus goes, but first I want uh, that. And of course we say, my rabbit dumb necklace? No! No, oh, Jesus, I'm not asking my rabbit dumb necklace. I mean, all my friends are wearing it. And, 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 and I've had it so long. Of course, I'm sure Jesus is going. I know. It's stinking. <laughs> You know, if that was the way God worked, there would probably be a lot of people that would say, Jesus, I'll get rid of this. Yeah, what do you got for me that's better? Yeah, yeah. You give me what's better, and then I'll let go of this, but that's not the way God works, is it? God says, you trust me, and obedience, you lay down what I tell you to lay down, and I will bring you the better. For some of us in this room tonight, there's great clothes that have slowed you down. For some of us in this room tonight, there are great clothes. Listen, I'm not going to stand up here tonight and give you a list and say, here's the bad things that I want you to get rid of. No, I'm going to let the Holy Spirit do that. I don't have to be the Holy Spirit hit man. I'll let God speak. What I want to know is when you willing to come before God tonight and say, God, I want all that you've got in store. I want to be free in you. 
I want to walk Jesus in the abundant life that I read about in that book. And I know that abundant life doesn't come from disobedience. It comes from lining up and doing their for Can I ask you to bow your heads with me real quick, please? For some of us in this room tonight, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask this for all of us to begin with. Would you be willing? This isn't about the girls. This isn't about the older men. This isn't about the younger women. This is about you. This is about you and God individually right now. Can I ask you a question? Would you be willing to say to God right now, God, show me if there's great clothes in my life? Show me. For some of us in this room, and I want you to hear this, great clothes are not just about the time before we came to Jesus. No, as we go to higher levels with Jesus, Jesus shows us the things that He wants us to take off, to peel off, so that we can go to new levels, new heights. Would you be willing tonight, all I'm asking you to do is this, would you be willing tonight to ask God, God, show me if there's a great close in my life. Would you be willing to pray that tonight? Tell me if I'm missing this because some of us in this room don't even need to pray. Because you already know what it is. Tell me if I'm missing this. There are some in this room right now that there are great clues of bitterness that you have towards someone that tonight God is saying, take it off, lay it down. I'm calling you. This is Jesus calling you out of the tomb tonight. Some of you have been in these tombs and God says, I want you to come out tonight. I want you to take off those great clothes. Take them off. Lay them down. Lay them down. I didn't create you for great clothes. You're meant to be in freedom. You're meant to be alive and enjoy the life. Come out. Come out. Come out. Take off those great clothes tonight. Lay 